James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Virgil Thompson is a composer, conductor, and critic. A man who can express himself, frequently with wit and sardonic humor, in print as well as in music. It was his opera, Four Saints in Three Acts, with libretto by Gertrude Stein, and first performed in 1934, that placed him in the ranks of America's foremost composers, a position he's retained for more than 40 years with an impressive outpouring of symphonies, chamber works, ballets, operas, and musical portraits. His incidental music to Robert Flaherty's film, Louisiana Story, won a Pulitzer Prize. For 14 years in the 40s and early 50s, he was chief music critic of the New York Herald Tribune, alternately delighting and infuriating the musical world with his impertinent and perceptive observations. He summed it all up in an autobiography entitled with typical straightforwardness, Virgil Thompson. Mr. Thompson, most creative artists, when they, they're, the intent of their work is known as soon as they finish, like an artist to a painter who hangs his painting on the wall. But well, the composer... If you think that paintings are exhibited on a wall as soon as they're finished, you don't know many a painters. Problem. On the other hand... They've got to find a dealer or a museum. But as a composer, is your work fully realized until you've heard it played by someone? Well, a musical score is a recipe. And a recipe is not a batch of beaten biscuits, you know. Yeah. But a, a recipe, which means then that it isn't realized until it's performed. No, it's mm -hmm. like an architect's drawing. It's mm -hmm. a project for uh, execution. Well, you do hear it in your own head as you're, as you're composing it. Oh, sure. You can't hear how Mr. So-and-so is going to sound exactly, but you know <laughs> what notes you want. Yeah. But there must be a greater satisfaction when you hear it performed outside the head. It can be good or bad. It can. That little experience. Uh, depending upon the quality of the performance, I suppose. Yes, you also make mistakes sometimes. Do you? And you say, I think I'm going to change that. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, too much brass or something. Mm -hmm. Do you go back and change it? Can you do that? Well, not that day. Yeah, of course. Uh, for that performance, yeah. but uh, before the thing gets performed, uh, anymore or recorded or published uh, what then it's still capable of alteration but there comes a point where you say I'm finished with this and no well, more I think publication are... is that point is it mm -hmm. do you do you enjoy hearing your own compositions or when you finished is that it as far as you're concerned I like to hear them until I'm sure it's all right mm -hmm. after that I would rather other people heard them mm -hmm. and you know no, when I you know reach, how it goes. You know when you, you know when you reach the point where it's all right. I don't want to sit right. there bathing in my own music you all don't? the time. Hmm. Hmm. Is it difficult to get per works performed? When I was young, it was very difficult for all the <clears throat> young composers, even the older ones, uh, to get uh, orchestral works or operas performed. Nowadays, the young uh, get performed, published, paid, commissioned, uh, all sorts of things, much earlier than we did. Mm. That's all good for them. Good. Is there any greater satisfaction in uh, the performance of a symphonic work, for example, than there is of a, 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 a chamber work 
where which obviously would be easier to perform with only three or four players involved. Well, it may take more rehearsal. But is there any greater satisfaction than the composer a because it's on a longer to learn a piece than it does a symphony yeah. orchestra? Yeah. I was thinking in terms of the satisfaction of the composer. Is it more satisfaction when so many more people are involved, so much more sound is produced? Well, or does the volume of the sound make no, no real difference? No, no, no. Yeah. The volume doesn't make any difference, except that we all like a nice, loud sound you do. here and there. Uh, and, of course, the orchestra has more variety of kinds of sound than the smaller compos. So it offers a but greater the, challenge. Smaller compos lend themselves to rhythm and line, so it all comes out in the wars. When did you first come in contact with serious music in Kansas City? You grew up in, in a, an environment that one doesn't think of as necessarily well, cultured the environment. Well, musicians around the house and in the family all the time. Your father was not a musician, though. No, no, my father was tone deaf. Was he? He couldn't tell one tune from another, yeah. except a few familiar hymns through the rhythm of the words. Uh -huh. But uh, my mother had a perfectly good musical ear. Uh, oh, I had an aunt who played the piano quite well. I had a cousin who played it quite well. Another cousin who was a very good violinist. There was music all around. And then Kansas City is not a hick town, you know. But as you were young, did you hear opera, symphony, perform? I heard my first opera at 12. Oh. And uh, a symphony orchestra around about that same time. Mm -hmm. There were lots of band concerts so, in the public parks. Some, we have a long summer. And uh, I learned all about the Italian operas and the excerpts from Richard Wagner's operas. Mm -hmm. uh, got introduced to them through those band concerts. And bands make a wonderful sound. It's like a rich, warm bath. Hmm. It was your own, your own family and those that played music that first interested you in becoming a musician. You took piano lessons when you were five years old, did you not? Well, I asked for them. Did you? Why? Well, because I, uh, I had musical proclivities. I was already standing at the piano with my foot on the loud pedal and improvising all sorts of bangings around, which I called the Chicago Fire and similar mm. illustrative titles. And I guess the family thought it'd be better give me lessons. To... <laughs> the family was never opposed to anything like that. They thought everybody should have what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And of course, children do have to be kept busy. The busier you keep them, the less devil yes. they get into. You declared yourself as a musician when you were Thirteen or fourteen years old, as I yeah, recall. Yeah, sort of like that. Mm -hmm. You always have a some kind of a bolt from the blue. But I uh, was but I had a lot of music lessons by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, Good th teachers. This didn't come out of nothing. It came out of uh, a rather elaborate musical experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, just like uh, you know, you decide you're going to get married or join the army. Or, were they good teachers that you had? I had good teachers uh, from about the age of uh, 13, 12, 13. Mm -hmm. uh, my earlier teachers, except for my cousin who was pretty good, uh, were not so good. Mm -hmm. You're, uh, a large part of the influence upon your early musical life was the church itself, was it not? Well. I was brought up in a Southern Baptist family, and we went to church every Sunday. And there was lots of music around. Again, from the time I was 12, I started to have organ lessons, and then to uh, sing and play along with uh, my teacher, who was the organist at the Episcopal Cathedral in Kansas City. Uh, I found the... Uh, music in the Episcopal services more interesting to me than the Baptist thing because it was newer, stranger, and in a way there was more of it. And it also worked on a higher taste level, it was kind of snobbish then when you were young. Uh, afterwards, I realized that the lower you get in the 
taste level uh, in a way, the more authentic is the religious music of America, mm -hmm. like the revival hymns and the uh, Negro shoutings and all that. That's the authentic. Oh, it's terribly authentic because it's it's not made uh, for the well to do. Mm -hmm. Did you have any aspiration to become an organist or? I was an organist from the age of 12. I mean, in, in, within church. Of course, you played the organ in the church at a very early age. Yes, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you get jobs like that and you may make $5 a Sunday, which was lots of money in 1910. Uh, but for a child. Yes, of course. And it makes you feel frightfully professional to earn something at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You did become a professional musician, as you say, at a very early age, did you not? But yes, professional uh, means that you get paid for it, yes. and it means that uh, people can demand in return for that payment certain standards of performance. Mm -hmm. You were not really, uh, while you did play in church, you were not really of the church, were you? Oh, I was subjected to lots of religion when I was a child, but none of it ever took on me much, mm -hmm. except the musical parts of it. Mm -hmm. You went to Harvard, ultimately, after some time in the Army during World War I. Yes. You joined up in the Army before. Well, I was in the same regiment with Harry Truman. Were you? Sure. Why did you join the Army? Well, the First War, first war was rather fun. It excited all the young, uh, particularly uh, in America because we didn't get in, you see, until 1917. And this had been going on in Europe for uh, since f 14. And with all the stories we read in the newspapers and the photographs of Belgian babies on bayonets and the uh, terrible experiences of trench life, any young person would say, I'd like to get into a war like that. Because here were people of your own age testing their powers of endurance, and you were just sitting at home being quiet. Mm -hmm. Young people don't like that. You ultimately went from Harvard to Europe with the Harvard Glee Club. Yes. And stayed on yes, for a sir. year in Paris to study with Nadia Boulanger at the same time Aaron Copeland was there. Yes, we were together. Why did you choose Nadia Boulanger? She was recommended to me by a friend from Harvard who had discovered her the spring before. I see. And uh, I went around and uh, talked with her, and she seemed to be like more or less what I was looking for. What were you looking for? Well, I was looking for uh, pursuing my studies in a serious European way. And I was looking also for uh, instructors who had a, what I would have considered a proper consecration to their art. Mm -hmm. Why in a serious European way? Well, because American instruction was a little amateurish sometimes mm -hmm. compared to the uh, strict European standards. That isn't so much so now mm -hmm. because musical instruction here, uh, especially at the... Uh, first-class conservatories uh, is uh, itself very first-class. Mm -hmm. There were some very great composers, I suppose, living in Paris at the time you first began to study there right after World War I. Well, the French were all there, <laughs> and the, uh, uh, there were Russians. Stravinsky was there. Did you know these people? Yes. I knew practically all of them. What influence did they have upon you? I have the vaguest idea. <laughs> They made me feel it was all right to be a composer. Which I suppose was important to a young man. Well, of course. What, what point did you decide to become a composer rather than a performing musician? Oh, long in my teens. Was there a reason for this? Reason, if any, would be that uh, I liked the idea of writing music, and, and I liked I wouldn't say that I liked too much the music that I wrote, but I liked the act of doing it. I also liked 
uh, being a pianist and an organist and a performer in public, you know, an old stage ham liking public appearance and mm -hmm. so forth, but I like the inside of things. And did you spent 14 years, of course, in Paris during one of its most exciting periods. Did you feel... Well, that was not from the first time. I, I came yes. back uh, the, uh, from Paris after about a year and a quarter or something, and then went back to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I taught at Harvard a bit, and I played the organ in Boston. And I spent a year studying in New York. It was three years later that I went back to Paris to stay. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to stay in Paris then? Well, for the same reason you'd gone there originally? Yes. There was a great exodus, you know, in the 20s. Uh, the American writers and painters after World War I flocked into Paris. As Gertrude Stein used to say, it wasn't so much what France gave you as what she did not take away. Mm. Because America in those days was mm. always correcting you for your own good and got a little tiresome. And so I said, uh, if I were going to starve, I might as well starve where the food was good and the people agreeable. How did you Intolerant earn Tolerant about my art, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, you always had to defend yourself in America for being a musician or a composer or something. How did you support yourself in Paris? Well, I had a little money I had saved up from uh, writing pieces for magazines. And then I had a few commissions here and there, uh, and actually I never have known. There was a period of about uh, five or six years when I lived on virtually nothing, but I still ate. What are your recollections of Gertrude Stein, with whom you worked during these years? on several things, including, of course, Four Saints and Three Acts. Well, we did two operas. Mother of Us All. Yes. Hmm? Well, my recollection of Gertrude Stein, for heaven's sake, I, uh, uh, we were very close friends for 20 years. Was she difficult to work with? No, not at all. She's difficult to live with, but not to work with. I see. Uh, and to say you could quarrel with Gertrude if you wanted to. Did you? Uh, she tried to quarrel with me once, and I just walked away. Stayed away for three years. But you were brought back together again? Oh, yes, sure. And she forgave you, or you forgave her? No, we didn't go into that. <laughs> I see. We were very glad to see each other again. That's the best way to handle one of those uh, quarrelsome situations, is to just back away from it and wait till it's all over and then you could start up again, but uh, analyzing it with recriminations and who was wrong or right about things, that just starts more. What attracted you to Gertrude Stein's work? Why did you collaborate with her on these two operas? Well, because I had read the work and I thought it was terrific. Which was reasonable. I thought enough. she was such a wonderful writer. Mm -hmm. First book of hers I ever saw was uh, Tender Buttons. And that remains, of course, to this day, the most difficult. To understand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was just about completely uh, incomprehensible. But at the same time, vastly picturesque. Did, did the, the difficulty of her work offer a challenge to you as a composer? But it offered a simplification as a composer because with the meaning eliminated, because either you can't understand it or there are so many uh, possibilities of different layers, layers or levels of meaning, uh, with all that abstracted, so to speak, uh, one could uh, treat it for the nature and sound of the English language mm. without illustrating the birdie babbling by Brooke. Mm -hmm. or heavy, heavy hangs my heart. You also knew James Joyce. Yes, I did. And what are your recollections of him? Were, was it a, a friendship as close as with Gertrude Stein? Not as close. I didn't see him as up. Of course, uh, Joyce was uh, ill a good deal of the time. Mm -hmm. He uh, had 
30-some eye operations when I was in those 20s. And uh, he had to be careful of his health. And in the evening, he wasn't even allowed to drink whiskey. He drank good old white wine. Uh, I met Joyce through uh, George Antile, who was a composer colleague, and Sylvia Beach. And uh, we had very pleasant relations, and he always liked my music. And when my music was performed in those days, he would always come and hear it. Well, naturally, I was very grateful for such a compliment from such a source. But he was busy, and uh, there was no uh, special occasion uh, for my seeing him uh, with any regularity. He was busy with his work, which took many hours a day on account of his, the state of his eyesight. And then he was busy with his health, which included the eyesight. Uh, Gertrude was far more available because uh, she didn't work that long hours. She worked every day and produced an enormous amount of work, but every day a little bit. Yes. And then she was always around, would walk the streets of Paris, would go out in the car and talk with people of an evening. She was very sociable uh, and uh, always in the best of health. I wouldn't say that I became a friend of Gertrude's because she was more available than Joyce. I was, became a friend of hers because I uh, liked her and her work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I liked Joyce and his work, but if it had been a question of uh, choosing between the two of them, uh, I would have chosen Gertrude Stein because we, uh, uh, I was closer to her work. Were there composers uh, of that period that influenced your own music particularly? Well, you're, you're always influenced by the, uh, your immediate predecessors, you see, mm -hmm. who were uh, Debussy, Ravel, Satie, Stravinsky. That's the heritage that you assume. Well, that, that you grew up with, so yes. to speak. Mm -hmm. What about Mio? Mio is closer to my age, you see. Yes. And he had, a, I think he had considerable influence on me and on almost every one of the composers around at that time. Because uh, Mio had an awfully uh, easy way of writing music. Uh, and uh, in his shadow, uh, you wrote easily. Uh, there seemed to be a change in your own um, style from your first symphony to your second, from ultra-modernism to what you called neo-romanticism, a kind of rejection of some of the influences of the modern composers of that time. Well, uh, you know, as you get along in your youth and early maturity. Uh, if you don't change, you're no good. But wasn't this a change backwards rather than forward? It doesn't make a difference. I don't admit backwards and forwards in I those see. matters. Mm. How do you feel about trends in, in modern music and in, in composition today in the last oh, 15 years? Oh, I think this trend business, uh, it's like trends in women's fashions. Uh, it's largely uh, an invention of the advertisers and of the textbook people. Because throughout the history of music, all the trends exist at all the times. Then this is not a direction of growth? It's just a direction of what is fashionable. And fashionable is whatever in any region somebody thinks is fashionable. Then it doesn't even mean box office. Then much of what's being written today will be forgotten? Well, naturally. Much of what's being written in any period, I suppose, is yeah. forgotten, is it not? I presume a lot of mine will, too. Mm -hmm. Will, uh, are, are we likely then to return to uh, a more conventional kind of composition, a kind of melodic Well, music? that's a little bit on the uh, programs of the performances right now, uh, in the same way that the uh, young men and women at the more advanced colleges are now wearing shorter hair and bathing more and cleaning their shoes and they even wear matching waistcoats now up mm -hmm. at Yale and Harvard. 
but they're still composers are still composing what seems to me to be music that is somewhat remote from the kind of music for example that you have composed music that is uh, almost mathematical it seems almost to be a challenge to the mind rather than to the heart well there's always been mathematical music yeah, too the 14th century music was terrifically mathematical <laughs> Uh, particularly in France. Uh, I don't think it's worthwhile to get uh, excited or confused uh, about the seeming not going anywhere-ness of music or art or painting. Uh, it's much more interesting where it has been than where it's going, because you don't know anything about where it's going. Uh, it's hard enough to find out where it is. But after all, the, uh, the overtone series is built into the human ear. Do you listen to music a great deal? Almost not at all. Why? Well, because I, I can make it in my own head. I have a radio, but I never turned it on. I don't have a television at all, and I uh, I very rarely go to uh, concerts or musical events. Are there composers that you favor other than Virgil Thompson? Well, come on. I, I mean, do you there hear are other the great masters of music, ancient and modern? And then I have my close musical friends. Who are your close musical friends? By musical friends, I mean people uh, who have been my colleagues uh, uh, for years and who like my music and whose music I like. That, that's true of uh, Darius Mio, of, of Aaron Copeland, of Roy Harris, of Bill Schumann, uh, and uh, even with Stravinsky, he was always very nice about my music. We used to come to hear it, make complimentary remarks. Do you find any friendship with those of the last several centuries, for example, that you didn't know? Well, you, nowadays that everything is published and recorded, practically, uh, there's no obscurity there. It's the same way as with the, uh, the visual arts people. You don't, they don't have to go to Italy to see the museums or Asia for the monuments, because it's all in very large picture books on their library tables. Mm -hmm. Na naturally, it's nice to be able to see them. Thank you For very real. much. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Well, it's been a pleasure.